All right, so we're going to begin our discussion on claims and validities. This is something that your textbook really, really hits on. This is something that's important for research methods in general. So the first thing we're going to talk about is types of claims. There are three key types of claims in research. Frequency claims, association claims, and causal claims. As you're reading research or hearing research, it's important to try to pick out which of these claims is a, a study is trying to make about their findings. Also, as a researcher, it's important to go into a study with a clear vision of which type of claim you're wanting to investigate. So we're going to talk about the differences in the three of these. The first one is a frequency claim. I need to make myself smaller. I am in the way. Okay, is a frequency claim. A frequency claim, all we're doing is describing the level or degree of a single variable. We're not saying it's related to anything. We're not trying to say what caused it. As the researcher, I'm not manipulating it and changing it and controlling it and dividing people into groups. And this one does this and this one does this. All I'm doing is documenting the level or degree of a single variable. If you remember our last set of videos, you, you'll remember the term measured variables versus manipulated variables. Um, if you have no idea what those words means, make sure you check out the, the introduction to variables video. But a frequency claim is a claim that's involving one measured variable, not manipulating it, not saying there's a relationship. If I survey all of you and I ask you, how many cups of coffee do you drink in the morning? That's a frequency claim. I'm trying to figure out among my psychology, behavioral sciences students, how many, uh, on average, how, how many of them drink caffeine in the morning and how many servings of caffeine do they drink on average among those who do drink caffeine? And I might break that down, right? Like, you know, 90% of you do versus don't drink caffeine in the morning. Of those who do drink caffeine in the morning, 80% have one serving of caffeine, or uh, that wouldn't work out. Of those of you who do drink coffee, you know, caffeine in the morning, 40% have one serving of caffeine. 40% have two servings of caffeine, and the remaining 20% have three or more servings of caffeine. I know I'm probably undershooting that number. Um, but, but the point is, all I'm doing is I'm trying to get a number, a frequency, a basic statistic. If I ask you, um, oh, I don't know, on average, how many hours a week do you work? And then I'm going to break that down and make a chart of, of current students. Here's the number of hours that, you know, on average, everyone's working. That's a frequency claim. I'm not trying to say the number of hours you work is related to your grades, is related to your stress level, anything. I'm not dividing you up into groups and saying, okay, y'all cut down on your numbers of hours of work for the, this semester for the study, which wouldn't be feasible, which gets back to measured and manip manipulated variables if you remember that content. But so frequency claim, all I'm doing is asking you a number. Um, from frequency claims, we get something that we commonly refer to as a descriptive statistic, right? I'm just describing it. That's all I'm doing. What's the number? So how many servings of caffeine a day? What percentage of people text while they're driving? Things of that nature. Not changing it, not comparing it, not saying cause and effect, just how many are there? The next type of claim is an association claim. Now, association claim is where I am trying to propose that there's a relationship between two variables. But the important thing here is I cannot propose that it's a cause and effect relationship. So for an association claim, I am proposing that two variables are related, or my study has indicated that two variables are related. As one changes, the other changes. One particular measurement of this variable is likely to be associated with a specific measurement in the other variable. Now, obviously, I need at least two variables for this to work. This is what we refer to as a correlation. And correlations can be either positive or negative. So when we make an association claim, we need to make sure we specify what is the direction of this association. A positive association claim or a positive correlation is where both of your variables move in the same direction. As one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down, right? As 
Number of hours of sleep increases. You also see an increase in documentation of mood or overall level, level of optimism. Um, as number of work hours decreases, you also see a documented decrease in number of, um, I don't know, in, in number of, of heart attacks and strokes, right? Um, so as one goes up, the other goes up. As one goes down, the other goes down. Now, a negative correlation is not where they both go down, is not where one is having a subjectively negative impact on the other. A negative correlation only means they're moved in two different directions. Make sure you understand this. I think this is probably, this is within the top five of wrongly used terms in statistics and research methods classes. And one of the questions that students most frequently miss on quizzes. A negative correlation, a negative association claim is that your two variables are moving in opposite directions. As one goes up, the other goes down. As one goes down, the other goes up. Um, as amount of sleep decreases, stress symptoms increase. As frequency of alcohol consumption increases, grades decrease. These are moving in opposite directions. That's a negative correlation. Now remember, if both variables are decreasing together, that is still a positive correlation because they're moving in the same direction. For it to be a negative correlation, they have to be moving opposite. One goes up, the other goes down. For an example, frequency of exercise is associated with intensity of anxiety symptoms. We're not saying frequency of exercise is causing anxiety symptoms. We're not saying, we're just saying they're related because it could be, it could be either way, right? It could be the more you exercise, the less anxiety you feel. Increasing exercise reduces anxiety, cause and effect. It could be the less anxious you feel, the more you feel like exercising. So maybe the cause and effect is going that direction, that lowering somebody's anxiety is going to increase how much they exercise because they actually feel like getting up and moving and they feel good and they're not stressed and worrying and so we don't know which direction it's going. We can't determine cause and effect. An association claim comes from correlational research and comes whenever the studies were not able to be manipulated and randomly assigned in such a way that we can claim causation. So it's just an association claim. We're just saying that they're related, okay? They are related, they are associated, but we always steer clear of cause and effect language when we're talking about association claims. Another example would be length of cohabitation among romantic partners is related to arguments about finances. We're just saying they're related. We can't say one causes the other. Maybe, maybe it is that the longer you've been living together, the more it causes arguments about finances because you have more bills you're splitting, you're, you're having a longer length of time seeing this person's spending habits. And maybe it is the longer you live together, it causes more of these arguments. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the more you argue about finances, the longer a person's, the longer a couple is likely to stick it out and keep living together because if they're arguing about it, at least they're discussing it, they're comparing money, they have their numbers on the table, they're trying to fix it. And so maybe you see longer cohabitation as a result of open communication about money. And so it's kind of going the other direction. The point with an association claim is we don't know. It could be going either way. So all we can say is we know that they're related to each other. That's it. We know they're related to each other. Now, this is not a prediction, but this can be a helpful start for future research. Because let's say, let's go back to the example about frequency of exercise and anxiety symptoms. Let's say I find this relationship. I find that there is a negative correlation between anxiety symptoms and frequency of exercise, meaning as one goes down, the other goes up. As anxiety symptoms decrease, exercise increases. As exercise decreases, anxiety symptoms increase. This can be a helpful start for future research because maybe I want to take this and say, I want to see which direction this is going. If 
frequency of exercise is something I, as a researcher, could very easily turn into a manipulated variable. I could randomly assign people to groups. I'm going to turn this into something else, which we're about to get to. But for now, that's when a, what an association claim is. They are related, but we cannot say cause and effect. We can just say a relationship. Now, let's say I want to take this study and turn it into cause and effect. I would then be switching this to a causal claim. A causal claim is when I've had the appropriate research methods and the appropriate statistical analysis to document that one variable causes changes in another variable, and I keep getting in the way of my test. One variable causes a change in another variable. This must be supported by a research study that has employed experimental methods, meaning I've been able to randomly assign participants to groups for an experimental group and a control group, and I've had a manipulated variable and a measured variable. Those terms should be very familiar by now. If not, make sure you check out the introduction to variables video. But this has to be supported by an independent study. So for the example that we're to, to carry over about anxiety and exercise, I can manipulate the variable of exercise, right? I can take all the people who want to be involved in this study and I can create three groups and I can say you for the next eight weeks, you're not exercising. I don't care what your exercise routine was before you, you are at zero. You don't do it. I take another group and I say for the next eight weeks, every morning or afternoon, six days a week, I want you to go and I want you to take a walk for 30 minutes. And then maybe I have a third group and I say you six days a week for at least 30 minutes. I want you to go out and I want you to jog. You can do it in your neighborhood, you can do it on a treadmill, you can do a trail at the park, don't care, I want you to jog. Because maybe I'm also wanting to see if there's a difference in intensity of exercise. The point is, I as the researcher have enough control that I can split people into groups and I can manipulate one of my variables of interest and then I can measure the outcome of anxiety levels. And if I find that after I've manipulated this, that the groups who exercised more had lower anxiety symptoms than the groups that did not exercise, I can more confidently say, okay, it's going the direction that introducing exercise is decreasing anxiety. So that's kind of how that would work. Another example would be family meals increase grades in elementary school children. Let's say I took random volunteers and I said, okay, you guys, for the next month, it, you know, let this, not, not that this was a say people would really agree to, but let this kind of fall to the wayside. Go through the drive through for fast food. Let your kids sit and watch a movie while they're eating dinner. Just kind of let, let it be a free for all. Eat food. Make sure your kids are fed. And I take another group of participants and I say, okay, for the next month, you are going to prioritize family meals at least three nights a week during the school week. I want you sitting at your table, eating dinner as a family, discussing your day, whatever it might be. You can get takeout if you want, but the point is you're all sitting at the dining room table together as a family. And then I compare the grades of those kids. As a researcher, since I have controlled this, that would give me a little bit more authority to say family meals can increase grades in children, right? Because if I just survey a bunch of people and ask them, how often do you eat dinner together at a family? What are your kids' grades? And I compare those. That doesn't give me enough power to make cause and effect. That's an association claim, like what we talked about. Because it could be the family meals are increasing, or maybe there's a third variable out there that there is something that is being related to both the ability to have meals together as a family and the kids' grades being higher, right? Maybe, maybe one parent does not work very long hours, and so they're able to orchestrate. We do family meals, and since they're not working a lot of hours, they're able to sit and study with their kids and read with them and quiz them on their spelling words and help them with their science projects. And so grades are higher because you have the parent with the free time to facilitate both those things. So maybe one of those is not actually causing the other. It's some other variable floating around in here. And that's the importance of causal research is so that we know, okay, what's actually causing this? Because if we think in terms of practical application, 
causal research is the stuff that we can use to make people's lives better, right? If we can say, hey, you might feel like crap, but if you can drag yourself out the front door and go for a walk for 30 minutes each morning, research has shown that reduces anxiety symptoms. We can actually help people live more high functioning enjoyable lives, right? If we can actually tell parents, hey, we have done research and we have found, even if you only have time for it two or three times a week, sitting down and eating a meal together as a family can help your kid's school performance. That can be motivation to not just run through McDonald's and sit in front of the TV and eat dinner. So causal research is important because that's what we can actually practically apply to help people know this, this can actually make things better. Um, and then another one is reducing time spent on social media increases average daily mood. As a researcher, that's something that I can manipulate. I can tell people, I can even as a researcher install an app on their phone or on their computer. Like, okay, this group, 30 minutes a day on social media, enough to see some updates from some friends, post a cute photo or two, tell everyone how awesome your dog is, 30 minutes a day, that's it. And maybe another group is down to 15 minutes a day. Maybe another group is an hour a day. And then one group is unlimited, whatever you want, right? And let's say I see that the my groups, the lower the number, the time was that I allotted them to, as the researcher, that I allotted them to have on social media, the higher their average daily mood was when I sent them a daily mood inventory. That would give me as the researcher the power to say, okay, reducing the time actually caused their mood to increase. It's not just a, a, an association that can be going either way, because logically it could be, right? If you're in a bad mood and depressed, it's very tempting to just sit and doom scroll for an hour while plopped down on the couch. So it could be that lower daily mood is leading to more time on social media because you're bored and your brain is burnt out and you don't have the motivation to do anything. So it could be working either way if all I've done is a correlational study, an association claim study, asking how much time you spend on social media and what your mood's like. So doing actual causal research where I'm randomly assigning groups and I'm manipulating a variable, that gives me so much more insight as a researcher to say, okay, I can actually say it looks like A is causing B. And then again, the practical application of, so what do we do about this? We let people know that Facebook and Instagram are not that great for your brain, which we already figured that out. That is a whole separate soapbox that maybe I'll circle back to later this semester. So that is your introduction to the three different types of claims that are important to look into whenever you read a research study or whenever you plan a research study.